start this uh, presentation tonight, and first of all, I want to thank you for coming. Um, this is more of an informational session than anything else, but I want to make you aware of a few things, uh, a little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, first thing, bathrooms are out the door to your left. Uh, number two, this is not in order of importance, but there is, but that one is, um, there is a yellow sheet in the back where you can sign up to have uh, questions if we have enough time at the end. This is scheduled to end at 7.45. The reason we say that is because the town board has an emergency meeting scheduled for 8 o'clock over at the Lansing Community Center. You're invited to come over there afterwards if you want to, to uh, listen to that. So 7.45 is our cutoff for tonight, so I'll try not to waste too much time here. And the, the third thing is that if your question has been answered through the presentation, please be aware of that. Uh, Ted Lux is, is taping this, as others are taping this. We normally put our town board meetings on the website. As you can see, this is confidential, which means we, Jerry has to, this is Jerry, Jerry Goodnow over here. This is John Marabella. Um, they're asking the permission of their bosses to release this. In the meantime, Ted will tape it, we'll give it to Patrick and the rec department, and when we get the okay, it'll be on the website, okay? So that's our with that. So having said that, um, to give you some background here, as our relationship continues with the power company, about two years ago they had tried to do a solar array. That solar array would have been approximately 18 megawatts, covered about 75 acres of land. That, for whatever reason, did not take off, did not, did not get any traction. Therefore, they've come back with a different proposal. As you can see tonight, this is one way that these power plants will not be a power plant anymore, they will not burn coal. And I'll say it one more time, this power plant will no longer burn coal. I think that's one of the things that everyone wanted, was that not to burn coal, it's not going to burn coal. It's not going to burn coal sooner than later, sooner than at the end of 2001. The other thing is that we're asking as people mill in here is that if you want to have conversations, whatever, please feel free to do it on the hallway so we don't want to disrupt the people that are trying to listen here. That's the third thing I wanted to ask. So getting back to this presentation, this is a, a courtesy that this company has done for us, which I appreciate. There has not been any allocation of power. They're still in that process. Hopefully that'll happen. If it doesn't, this is all moved. I hope it does happen. That's why we're trying to build up as, as, um, as much uh, company, excuse me, community support as possible. There have been letters of recommendation to do that. We hope to have a resolution passed by the town board tonight to also do that. The, the county has passed a letter uh, to go forth on that. So having said that, we hope that as a group we can have one voice from Tompkins County to get this project off the ground and move in a different direction. So there will be two presentations tonight, there will be some questions answered, then from there if we have time we'll have more Q&A afterwards, that's why it's important that you put your name down on the yellow sheet. Having said that, I think I talked long enough to 6 o'clock, 6.02, so on that note, I'll turn it over to Jared Goodnow and we can start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. I'm a little soft-spoken, so if, if I drown out, Raise your hand. I'll pick back up again. I, I, uh, I don't. My coaching voice is in here. Speaking of which, I had the opportunity tonight. I got here a little early. I ate out on the picnic tables, watching baseball warm up. And you know, sometimes they say that that sense of smell can trigger some things. How about that sense of hearing? Right? Who who doesn't enjoy the tink of a baseball on the bat? Man, it just oh, it's awesome. You know, it brings back memories. I did a lot of coaching. You have the guy with the smooth swing, and then you got the guy that's that bad ball hitter. You know, and, and you try to straighten that person out. My son graduated with one of those kids. I coached him for seven years. So I finally gave up on trying to straighten out his swing, just let him go at it. Man, the kid was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and there's somewhat, and I didn't really do this on purpose, but there's somewhat of an analogy here in that we've attempted, I have, for probably 10 to 12 years now, to figure out what to do on this site. You knew the time was coming. And 
a lot of times we're sitting here going, geez, we got an interconnect, we got a lot of land, we're a generator, let's keep on generating. And we really focused on that. And yet, here we are talking about a project that's about as far from generation as can be. Kind of a bad ball hitter. But we're really excited about this project. We'll get into it. I want to just give a brief more history in case you don't necessarily know um, John and I and what we've done at this at this plant. John Marabella has been doing environmental work at this plant since late 80s, early 90s. And you moved here in 93, 97. 97. So John's been a resident. Um, when I had the opportunity to work at the plant, I chose to uh, move to uh, Dragon. <laughs> we kept track of what was going on over here all the time. And um, I'm actually very pleased that, that Paul Southern's here tonight. So Paul, the reason we're here tonight is because of Paul. Paul hired us both at the, at the plant. Paul showed great leadership at that plant. And again, appreciate all you've done there. So to just can was I not loud enough? <laughs> So just a, again, a little more history, because I think the history is important here. So John and I started with NYSEG. I was mid-80s, John was late 80s. We worked in an engineering group down in Binghamton, worked on all the plants that NYSEG owned, had an opportunity to come up to then Millican Station in the early 90s when Millican went through a plethora of work, kind of a, a, re, a retuning of the plant mills and burners and uh, an FGE system was put in, um, a, a lot of work done. And in 98, the state said that the utilities had to deregulate, that sell off their generation assets. And I said was the first to do that in 99. John and I had, had an opportunity to transfer with the company, and that was AES, most of you probably know that. And um, AES owned these facilities through 2011 and early 2012. A couple other owners since then. The reason I want to bring that up is we were extremely proud to work for NYSEG and AES and even through these other ownership um, groups. Why is that? They always put safety first, they always put their people first, they always put environmental issues first. It's on everybody's mind, it's always been on everybody's mind through all the ownership groups. And I just I wanted to make sure you guys understood that. And what made that happen was the people at the plant and the leadership to make sure that we put that as a priority. Um, like I said, I've been looking to try to repurpose this site for a while. So we got word that a company called Bay Wolf Energy in the late 15s and early 16s was looking to acquire the assets. So of course, we've been through this before, what's the first thing you do? You get on the site, you start Googling Beowulf, who are these guys, what are they doing? Then they came and met with us um, in early 16. And I'll never forget this, the guy who came here, and he wanted to try to be here tonight, but he couldn't make it, Michael Henry, he does a lot of their community relations work. Great guy. He took a phone call. The phone call was from the governor's staff. It was the day that the governor was having his state of the state address. 2016, and he wanted to warn Beowulf during the address he's going to be announcing he's going to be closing coal. He wanted to let these guys know, you know, you probably don't want to be doing this, so you shut them down. And actually, Beowulf said, it's fine. We're not really looking at this as a long term energy play, anyways. We like the asset, we like the site, we want to figure out what we're going to do here. So I was pretty impressed with that. And of course, they stayed and they, they took control in May of 16. So when we sat down and said, what have you tried to do here? And I'm just going to list off a few of these. And again, I'm, I'm hammering on this tonight because I want you to understand that, that we try hard to repurpose this facility. There's a milk production plant that actually ended up locating in Cuba County. We tried hard to get them at our site. We looked at biodiesel. We looked at amoebas. We might have done this when Paul was here. We looked at amoebas to pass through a screen that was going to be a slipstream of CO2. They eat the CO2 up, you crush, you crush them up, they become fish food. It was a unique process. We couldn't figure out how to make it work. 
We looked at wood pellet plants. Of course, everybody knows we looked at converting to gas. And we've looked at solar and pump storage. And I want to echo a little bit what Ed said. So in 2017, NYSERDA came out with their first large-scale renewable solicitation for solar. We put in at this site and we put in at Somerset. We put in again in 2018. NICO also put out a solicitation that we submitted bids on. Okay, we just we haven't been able to win that bid. And the main reason why is that for a large-scale renewal, a large piece of your income is from the energy price that you're currently getting off the market. And in upstate New York, that energy price does not support these projects. We're continuing to put in, we're trying hard, we're going to put in this year. We just got, well, we think we're going to get qualified. We, we, we pre-qualified, we, we had to add one data sheet to that. So we're going to continue to put in solar. I know a question that's been asked is, are these projects coherent? Do they depend on each other? If we win a nice bid, we're going to bid sold. Okay? The data center is dependent on the state, on some state support for this. We're looking for a NIPA allocation, and we're looking for Empire State Development funding. Both um, programs exist within the state. We qualify for all the pieces to, to qualify for it, and so we're, we're we're working hard to try to get their attention to throw their support at these two projects. And like Ed said, and we've heard this, when communities show support for these, that helps them make their decision. So, you know, again, I'm very happy with the turnout, and uh, hopefully we can, you know, get some letters written from this community to show that support. Okay, and then the, just the last piece on this data center, then I'll get into the meat of the presentation. So. How many, under, how many people in here understand, or no, let me ask the question this way first, how many people know what REV is? Not Ithaca REV, but REV out of the PSC. Raise your hand. Okay. How many people understand what REV is? <laughs> Raise your hand. Okay, that's good. So REV, the word animate the market, has been used a lot for those folks that raise their hand. Yes, right? in, in, what does that mean? What that means is end users and producers both have to understand what the market is doing at that time. If the market is in high demand, where's the price? It's a high price. It's an incentive for people to, to turn down their air conditioning, do laundry later, that type of thing. This project fits right in with REF. And when we've talked to the ISO and the PSC about this project, the fact that it has a turn down at the times of peak demand, and that's what we're targeting, right? One of the things that we're trying to do is say, okay, if a plant's only running 2% of the time to meet peak demand, let's shave the peak, let's not use that expensive generation. <clears throat> and so, this particular project can be a great turn down, almost like a reverse battery. And I'm going to hit that again, but I want people to understand that we've received a lot of um, uh, anticipation from the PSC and the ISO on being able, this could be large, right? You could turn down 30, 40 megawatts within seconds. That's a pretty big deal. Okay, on to the presentation. So when we have talked about this project to the state to garner support, we, it's the Empire State data. It, it concerns both the plants that we own. Somerset plant in Niagara County, on the shores of Lake Ontario, and of course the plant here. I will target the plant here, but we've been presenting this as a whole. And so some of the questions that I've received have said, wait, you've said 650 in capital, you've said 100 in capital, what, what do you mean? Okay, well I'm going to go through those numbers. And, and I get the fact that it can be confusing. Let me just take this piece off. Okay, so in Somerset, another great place for this. 1,800 acres. Uh, it's on a nice egg interconnect, 345 kV. That's a pretty large transmission. The Cuga site, uh, 
434 acres, you're more familiar with this site, on 115, three lines leaving. Uh, the rest of that information was more for the stakeholders that we were presenting to. Um, you'll notice that we highlighted IBEW. There's a total of 43 folks at the plant, and um, there's a few here, so I'm going to be careful with this statement. It's not an age discrimination statement, but we are pushing 55 years as the average age, of which the guys here tonight, I'm sure, are younger than that. Correct? <laughs> okay. So the next slide was an attempt to show what has happened since Beowulf took over in 16. And this may be hard to read, but I've already highlighted the 2016 one, right? The governor's saying, I'm going to close these plants. We targeted trying to go to gas. So we put a poll out. We tried to get as wide an audience as we could, starting to ask questions about gas. So we highlighted that. We, as we talked about, we've looked at solar projects. Now I want to stop here because another question that has been asked, wait, I've seen 15, I've seen 20, Ed said 18 tonight. So I want to make sure you understand. I want to go back to the fact that I'm trying to get solar done regardless of the data set. So we're out there soliciting bids. Sometimes 15 megawatt is what we put in for a solicitation. Sometimes it's as much as 20. There's not going to be a ceiling on this. If I can get some solar built, then we're going to try to do some more. And then we're going to try to do some more. So if you see different numbers, there's not any really plain there. It's just the fact that it may be what we were talking about that day when we talked to uh, a developer. There's room on this site for probably 30 megawatts. Um, there's, there's a, remember that black walnut grove right on Starks Road? That's mature now. It's beautiful walnut grove. I hate to cut that down and put solar on, right? But there's some places that we're trying to work around. But there's room for probably 30 megawatts. Okay, May of 2018. So the governor announced I'm closing coal. He needed a way to do it. He decided to use a break called Part 251 through the D. So the DEC promulgated this, promu, prom, thank you, that, this reg. <laughs> and um, there's quite a few people in here who commented. They got over 5,000 comments on this reg. Um, so it took a while for them to get to this later step. But meanwhile, we filed paperwork saying, hey, we're going to convert to natural gas. We're going to use a pipeline. Well, outside public policy and the pushback, at the same time, energy economics have just gone down to the point where I don't even say the market's broken anymore. The energy market is non-existent on the wholesale side. And I'm going to long litany on that, including what the ISO has put out lately to talk about that. But there, but there is no energy market. So the fact that the county and the town did resolutions against gas and the fact that there's just plain no market you know, right now doing any generation on this site that would be wholesale driven, not a subsidy side like the renewables just isn't going to work. <coughs> okay, uh, June 2018, the final regs were put out. So how they're doing this as far as, see, uh, they're trying to close, uh, they, they probably will close coal through the CO2 reg. And they're starting by notching at an emissions level that everybody else can make, but coal can't. And, and so probably what happens next, this is an opinion, not a fact, is the DEC will come out a little later, notch that down, maybe start to hit some fuel oil and continue to notch down. That's just my crystal ball. But the first time through, they've hit coal. I thought I saw Irene. Yeah. Here. In the jury box. Do you agree with my statement on that? Do you think they're kind of going to ratchet that down? Or? I don't think so. Oh, yeah. I, I, we might be on different pages on that, but I hope so. <laughs> okay, so um, in 19, and this slide is dated a little bit, but 
19, the governor and the state of the state came out with a Green New Deal, which now has been surpassed by the Climate Leader, no, Community Leadership Climate Protection Act, which, does anybody understand that? Yeah. That's got a lot of stuff in it. But as I've read through that, again, I think this project that we're doing pigeonholes into that nicely. The act talks about closing fossil fuel, transitioning, looking for projects that are more green. I think this fits in there perfectly. Okay, next John. So I want to hit this quickly, but we just didn't stumble on to data centers. We have another coal plant in Montana. The same issues going on in Montana. Kind of struggling. Less from public policy in Montana. More from just the fact that it's not economic. So um, our owner happened to be at some event with another guy who does a lot of artificial intelligence work. And they started talking about data centers. And the next thing you know, we've worked out a deal in Montana where we're building a data center on that site. Data center guys chase energy. That's what they're looking for. We know a lot about energy. That's how this marriage happens. They asked, geez, this is working good. Where can we do this again? And we said, well, we own some coal plants in New York. We started working through it. It's going to be a little bit different business model. Another question that was asked that we got, are you planning on powering this data center from the existing coal plant? The answer to that is no. This coal plant will shut down. Data center will be powered off the grid. Montana, the plant is going to power that data center. Next slide. So we have three more slides on this. This is the combined where Somerset and Kia are doing. It's an ideal campus. When you take a look at these, they have land, they've got great interconnects, they've got they've got access to lake for cooling water, they've got utilities, they've got employees on site to know how to manage the plant piece of this least as far as if we're going to use any utilities off from it, not to run the plan, and so it's very attractive. Uh, I miss anything. Skilled workforce, higher education. So combined at full load. So this is going to be a 100 megawatt site at Cuyuga, a 500 megawatt site at Somerset. Combined 600 megawatt site. $650 million of private investment. Around 200 new FTEs. We're, so we're going to talk about the labor force a little bit. This is a very difficult conversation to have. Some of these guys have been at this site longer than I've been here, and I've been here 31 years. They've been doing this work diligently. They've developed a skill set. These data centers require a different skill set. So we're sitting here trying to figure out how can we make this work. We haven't come up with that solution. I'm going to tell you right now. The folks at this plant have been extremely, extremely patient. I mean, we have, we have run, we have not run. We had a run Monday. We came on Monday. The market wasn't there. The ISO forced us on. So these guys are sitting home on a Sunday on a beautiful weekend, and they get a call. You got to come and run this plant. And we came in and we ran the plant. We we're 15 minutes early coming on. And of course, everybody was diligent in safety yeah. and environmental, right? So these guys deserve a ton of credit. So one of the things I want to ask for, and I know there's a ton of support for the employees, and I appreciate that, but just remember, behind all the good work that happens at this plant are these people that work very, very hard. Raw political support. I haven't ever <clears throat> sat down with and I got permission to talk about it with Lisa Dix from the Sierra Club and ever have her excited about a project that we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's written an op-ed. She's very much promoting this project. It, it's, it's kind of fascinating. Um, we've got a lot of construction jobs with this. And I realize construction jobs aren't full-time and temporary. That's what these construction guys do. They go from job site to job site. So we've got in the labor trades, very excited about this. We've got the folks that, that 
are looking for still an economic engine in their community inside of the budgets. We've got senators, assemblymen, um, other environmental groups um, excited about this. The League of uh, Conservation Voters are very excited about this. <laughs> And we have Irene. Sorry. <laughs> I missed the Jerry Barnes. Um, and, and I'm going to go into this, but I know when I first introduced this project, especially to the plant manager of this plant, who also couldn't be here today, he's out at another plant. It's called Data Center. What, what a data center? What are we doing at Data Center? What, what happens there? Well, I've been not diving into this for almost a year, and it, it's just amazing what's behind a data center. So I'm going to tangent a little bit and try to answer some more things that came up. So the initial feedback from data centers are, what are you going to do that, that Bitcoin stuff and that cyber currency stuff? The answer to that is, we don't think so. And it's not that we're not trying to, but the folks that we're working with as tenants on this, they're excited about storage, cloud storage. You know, how many people have pictures on their cell phones? That's all on a data center, right? Um, they're excited about large computational services. So what do I mean by that? There is a client in Europe, and I thought about you again on this, Paul. This, this is fascinating. In, 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 they make turbine blading. All shapes, all sizes, all torque ratios, all kinds of metallurgy. 20 years. And they have documented failures on these. And so what they're doing now is they're building some AI, some artificial intelligence that's going to tell them, I'm being facetious here, but two seconds before the thing fails based on all the computational data they have. And you know they're excited about that. Why? Because they're going to eventually save money. And, and that just takes months' worth of data. Um, I was at a TCAD annual meeting about three months ago. A professor from Ithaca College spoke. And he goes to Mayan ruins and he maps the Mayan ruins. And the data that he uses is months' worth of data. And then the computations take a year. Well, that's done at data centers. So, you know, as you start to look at commercials that are on TV and other things, you just, the, the amount of data center usage is increasing. I don't, most of us in here, I'm going to get in trouble for this comment again, but I don't see too many millennials in here. <laughs> They'll tell you the importance of data centers. They're dying for usage. Okay, I can't turn it again. So, next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to keep this up briefly, but this math all works when you start taking these projects and separating them and saying, okay, we're going to do 650 as a whole. At Somerset, it's a larger data center, 500 megawatts. We're going to do about 550 million capital there. The rest of this is Somerset, probably not interested. Let's get to the last slide. Okay, so this is what we're doing at Peter. 100 megawatt data center. That's the goal. We are starting at 50. We put in to the ISO, and I got it. I'm going to have a conversation on this, so I'm not going into a tangent here. We put into the ISO a 50 megawatt load interconnect. We asked to interconnect 50 megawatts at this site. I'll go into more of that in a second. Eventually, we're going to get to 100. We want to start at 50. 100 million dollar capital investment, 30 to 40 FTEs. So somebody asked, where are you getting these numbers from? So here's where we're getting them. Doing this in Montana, we see those numbers. It, it's, it's, this isn't the recipe to make the chocolate cake or the vanilla cake, but the, the kind of the ratio is for every 100 megawatts of energy usage, that somewhere's around 30 employees, that somewhere's around $100 million in capital. So I've just taken those numbers and ratioed them up as we've gone to these larger numbers and when I've looked, and a lot of this information you really can't get off from going and saying, okay, Google just announced a large 
um, project in Minnesota, but they are announcing their job numbers and we seem to be in line with them. So that's where the data is coming from. 60 megawatts construction, 100 construction jobs, 60 million in construction budget, 20 megawatts of solar, about 110 acres. So I'd like to get 20 megawatts out. If you see a different number, it's simply that maybe, again, that's the developer we're working with there. Uh, I think more than 20 can fit on here. That's what I'm shooting for. It addresses Tompkins County goal of no fossil fuel development, old industry with a new industry, ample, no, ample, ample acreage for a data center. Potential synergies for artificial intelligence, machine learning, Cornell, Ithaca, other locals. I'm going to come back to that bullet. So load following, rev project, load following. We can load follow what we've asked possible tenants. So what? how many hours is 1% of the year? Right? About 90 hours, 87.6 hours. So we've said, look, can you give us 100 hours where we call you up and we say, cut your power. They say, no. We say, well, what if we can give you a better electric price? They say, well, we're listening, right? So they want to do this as well. So we think that's going to be a good fit. And the peak, it might be a hair more, the super peak might be a hair more than 100 hours, but if we get out for 100 hours, it certainly helps in those peak times. Creates more stable revenue for local governments. I mean, that's been all over the property tax. We don't need to go into that. Okay, so learning sense. How many people know that the Cornell president has a, uh, uh, at least a master's, it might even be a doctor in artificial intelligence? Right? I didn't know that. So I started thinking, okay, perfect, right? And we're trying to work with other institutes. How many people know that SUNY Binghamton has a test center on their campus for data centers for energy efficiency and cooling efficiency? I did not, okay? The president of SUNY Binghamton also chairs the Regional Economic Development Council that this project falls into. So John and I are visiting SUNY very soon. So I'm very excited that these guys are actually looking at energy efficiency and cooling in this. So there's the fit university plan. And that means we're not going to stop trying to work with other universities. But I'm excited that we have a university in our backyard that I didn't even know about. Okay, am I done talking? Are you up? Okay, so what we want to do next, so this is the project. And you, you still might have questions, but what we really like to do is try to get to another presentation on the permitting side of this. And then we've taken the questions that we've received and kind of lump them in. And if we haven't already an answered them, we're going to kind of ask them directly, answer them. And then at the end, we'll take further questions. I think we've done a pretty good job of answering the questions that we've received at that time. So I'm dry. You're up. Okay. Okay. John Maribella. I'm the uh, environmental director for uh, the Cuba facility, the Cuba, uh, the Somerset facility, and also the Tampa Street facility in, in Massachusetts. Uh, as Jerry stated, you know we've gone way back. We've been through a lot together in trying to get you know the gener coal generation going to you know gas to a milk plant to biodiesel to you know fish farms. We, you name it, we've we've looked at it. All our options putting in a putting in a wallboard plant at one point. So we've been through it. Uh, I think we're finally to a point now where we can get excited about a project, about the data center. That I think is a win-win for the state, the community, the environmental groups. But I think we can, you know, this is something that you know we can sink our teeth into, and, uh, and uh, we can uh, we can get we can make this happen. So I'm going to get a little, go a little bit into the data center permitting, um, the 
solar permitting, and then going to some of the, uh, the regulatory on the, uh, on the closure uh, of the uh, coal facility. So one of the, obviously, uh, first things we're going to do is when we find a location for the data center, decide on that, we're going to issue a site plan application to the town of Lansing. Uh, it'll have a project description. Uh, it'll go through the project, the approximate acreage that will, that will be, that the uh, data center will take up. Um, it'll go through a land use, whether we put it on existing crush or run, or we have to put it in our, our, our metal, or where we're going to uh, put that, and the impact it may have on storm water, um, traffic, any traffic impacts, which may probably be minimal in this case, uh, any portable water usage or cooling water usage. We'll get a little bit more into that. Um, will it generate any wastewater? You know, like I said a lot of these are, can simply be answered. Um, any historical, archaeological um, requirements at this location? Uh, any determinations? Uh, storm water again, storm water discharge. Any has waste generated again? That's uh, a lot of these can be answered quite simply, being the, uh, the magnitude of this product, the project just being a data center. We'll also have to. Uh, Again, work with the town to come up and uh, the town engineer, town attorney, and to uh, go through a, a stormwater pollution prevention plan. So we'll go through, we'll have plans for any sediment and uh, erosion control during the construction, such as maybe having to place uh, you know, silt fences up, some type of temporary you know, uh, um, mitigation of, of stormwater, or re re uh, reflow of stormwater during construction, and then uh, also uh, be able to comply with the stormwater and control measures, such as maybe installation of any catch basins or any sediment traps uh, or any, like I said, re uh, any change in the uh, in culverts or diversion of any stormwater uh, away from the project site. So it'll be a, uh, be a detailed plan, both for construction and for the operation of the data center. Mm -hmm. We'll also submit an agriculture data, data statement because it is an Ag District 9, we are required to fill out that form as well, and the statement will, will be that whether we decide we'll be on the previously farmed land or not, or we'll just be in meadow, or like I said, on, on just asphalt or crusher run. A lot will depend on the location of it based on uh, how that form will be filled out. Uh, just to make the town will be the lead agency uh, with the oversight by the county. The county should pro will probably have a do a project review and comment under, under 239. Um, and we expect the DEC to, uh, to also review and comment on the, uh, on the stormwater pollution prevention plan and that as well. Uh, expect the town to make a determination on seeker, uh, work with the town again to go through whether this is a, uh, maybe it's a type one or a type two action, depending on whether there's any physical uh, alteration of the site. Um, and then the town to either issue a neg deck, negative declaration, or a positive declaration, um, which the positive declaration then require a full you know, environmental uh, impact statement. So we'll work through the town on that. If we'll size this project, you know, it should have minimal, a lot of minimal impact as compared to maybe the, the, the solar project, which I'll get into uh, in the next slide. We'll also have to deal with have a current, the plant currently has a water withdrawal permit withdraw the water from the lake. Um, we need to quantify that cooling, the amount of cooling water, the type of cooling water, whether they need how much potable water they need or how much lake water uh, source they would need. Um, we would continue to use the existing, we uh, put in a couple of years ago, uh, 0.75 millimeter wedge wire screens for impingement and entrainment reductions of aquatic species that would continue to be operated if we do intend to use the cooling water for the data centers. Um, but we do anticipate that obviously the withdrawal, the water withdrawal will be significantly reduced based on the current operation of the, uh, the coal fire uh, generation plan. We'd also have to make a determination based again on the location of the facility on the dual to perform a wetland del delineation as well, depending on, uh, again, the location. If we put it on in an area where we already have like a <coughs> parking lot, crusher run, wetland delineation would have to be done, but if there is a we have to put it somewhere in a meadow or somewhere near where we think that maybe there's a potential that it is a wetland, then we would do a, a full, full stage uh, wetland delineation on that, uh, on that uh, area. Um, and then upon town approval of the site plan application, um, we expect to get a, a building permit uh, to, to 
responsibility of the data center.
We also did a topographical and geotechnical survey to determine the depth of bedrock for being able to anchor the, uh, the solar uh, arrays and soil characteristics for the issues when we, as far as any loading of the, uh, of the solar arrays and also a contour map looking at final construction, uh, what kind of, uh, what are we dealing with as far as uh, slopes or how much you know, we have to put additional fill in in some of these areas. And it, we also got to get into endangered species as well. We did an endangered species uh, survey as well. And we did determine that the northern long-eared bat would be impacted. So um, one of the impacts that it was that if we do have to do any clearing, it can only, it can only be between November 1st and March 31st uh, to not impact the mating, birthing, or nesting uh, season of the, uh, the northern long-eared bats. We're also waiting to hear back from uh, the State Historic Preservation organization on uh, uh, the National Start, um, if there's any uh, determination of any archaeological uh, locations that we determined for the, uh, for the solar array. That is part of the uh, state, as I mentioned before, we plan on putting a portion of the solar panels on the landfill itself, the closed, capped landfill. So we will be involved with the DC, we'll be involved in that as part of the Part 360 solid waste. We, we will need to provide the final design drawings of the New York State, the DEC, and for a final approval. And we're looking at a, a ballast uh, solar uh, racking design. I don't know if we have that picture, Jerry. I'll show that. Okay, all right. But we're looking at, so as not to actually impact, I mean anchors, to impact the integrity of the liner on the landfill. So everything will just be placed right on the surface, so we don't have, won't have any won't have any alterations of the existing topsoil or have any impact to the, uh, to the liner itself, the final cap liner. Um, we'll also have to meet certain loading requirements as uh, specified with the DEC as well. So once we get their final approval, then we can move forward with, the, with installation on the, on the landfill. See, you asked then, me to do something and I screwed it up. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Have above that liner anchoring. What's that? How much between the liner and the topsoil do you have to anchor those solar panels? We don't have. We won't be anchoring. That's where we're going to show you. All the edges can be placed on the landfill. Okay. All the electrical. Everything will just be placed right on the surface. Nothing will penetrate the topsoil or the. Land. I tried to get yep. so you could see this yep. bit. See this right here. This just sits. Nothing is going to yes. penetrate it at all. Yep. You see, it's just like a corrugated concrete filled base. Is all it is. You know, just there it is. Everything will be on the surface. Nothing will penetrate. Unlike where the, the solar panels are placed, where they actually have anchors in the ground, they will not be anchored. These will be just right on the surface. They will physically alter. Yeah. Again, we'll continue to work, you know, we'll work closely with the town as part of the site application, the county and the DEC, uh, to get the, uh, the permitting uh, finalized for the, uh, the solar project. If and when, hopefully, if and when we get the approved and nice survey. We'll talk a little bit about the regulatory site closure. Um, we'll continue after closure, continue to operate under current permits. 
Um, we'll continue to maintain compliance, closure, post closure, uh, with all permit conditions to ensure that there's no adverse environmental impacts. So we'll just continue to meet all the conditions of all, of all, uh, of all our permits. Uh, we'll also have a list of uh, say, uh, financial and legal obligations for uh, asset retirement obligations as part of the closure of the facility uh, for renewal and rest restoration of the, of the closed site. Uh, some of those is uh, the coal pile. All coal will be removed from the, from the lined coal pile. Um, water will continue to be monitored there as we monitor it now and be treated like it is now through our uh, water permit discharge. So that will monitor, continue to be monitored until such a time where we can be com in compliance with uh, a water permit without having to treat the water. Um, bulk storage tanks, every, all the petroleum chemical products will be removed from those bulk storage tanks. They will be cleaned, they will be mechanically isolated, they will be uh, labeled that they are closed, pictures will be taken, that will be sent, and they will be deregistered with the DEC. Uh, all pumps, motors, equipment in the facility will be drained of all any kind of oil, oils or, or coolants, like I said, to, to uh, lessen any environmental impacts, so there's no adverse environmental impacts for the closure of the facility. We also have in place a landfill uh, site financial assurance that's in place. Uh, it's an assurance basically to the state, which ensures that the landfill uh, will be capped, the final cap, monitor and be maintained for 30 years after final closure. Um, this will be enacted if the owner is not financial capable of meeting these requirements. Um, so based on this, we, there is no um, current contamination of the site and we will continue to monitor it out 30 years to ensure that there is, continues to be no contamination at the site. Uh, we have an extensive groundwater monitoring, surface water monitoring network that will continue to be in play for the next 30 years after the closure. Okay, thanks, Jack. Okay, so I asked about regulatory process. So, let me back up. And you heard Jen say it once. So we went into in-depth on permitting there, but there was a lot of questions on permitting. We anticipate working very closely with the town. We will initiate that process to different projects when we win one of these solicitations. Solar is really expensive to do, especially in upstate New York. When we win one, we're going to be in here trying to work through this permit. Same will be for the digs. Okay, so Ed has made it extremely clear. I'm going to give you some credit if I just stood up. That there have been electrical issues in here. And so I'm assuming that the plethora of questions that we received on what's going to happen when you have this large load, what's going to happen when the plant goes away, what's that process, we're, we're perhaps stems from that, okay? So we don't get to make that decision. So let's talk about the load interconnect. We've applied, I said that earlier, we applied for a 50 megawatt load interconnect. The ISO, working with, I'm going to try to be very careful with my terminology here. The New York State Independent System Operator, who governs the reliability of the grid, will be the determining factor on what happens when you add a load to this area. It's a process they go through. They will work with the CTO, the connecting transmission owner, NYSEC. Both of them will sit and they'll model a load. And it, it, the terminology is extremely difficult. But they do scenarios. They'll do a base case scenario. They'll do what they call an N minus one scenario. So that's a contingency scenario. Okay, it works as a base case. Let's eliminate a transformer. Let's eliminate a circuit. Let's take this piece of generation out of the system. Does it still work then? Then they'll go to two scenarios, N minus one, minus one. Then they'll come back to us with the results of the study. And they will let us know what it's going to take to add load to this area. They'll do 
on a system impact basis, and they'll do it on a voltage basis. So we will know when they talk to us. On the generation side, it's basically the same process. You put our notice in, you say we want to shut down the plant, they'll go through a study process. Fairly familiar, we did that in 2012. The outcome was, nope, you're needed for reliability. We went through a long reliability stint. Unit 2 is currently in an ICAP, ineligible force outage, it's mothballed. They did a study on that, it wasn't needed. When we put a notice in for one, they'll go through that same study. We're not guessing at the determination. The, the, the betting money says since they've already done the major upgrades, there isn't an issue that we're certainly not stating at all, which is going to go through the process. Okay. I'm going to read the questions that we tried to lump into certain buckets here. We have about three pages worth, and then we'll, we'll have a quick dialogue that one of us will take. Okay? Where we're both standing. So, PSC, I think I covered this one. The PSC has made a couple of rulings on, on cryptocurrency server farms. Does this affect you? So what happened here? These guys that are doing Bitcoin went to where the electricity is the least expensive. Municipalities, the closest one to us is Groton, but the one that made the headlines was up north in, in the north country. They moved in, they started using a lot of energy, they used up the bucket of municipal electricity that was allowed in their contract, and the residents who were part of that municipality had to end up paying more. It was a big surprise. The PSC came in and ruled and said, you can't do that. That's not what we're doing here. We're going to take energy off the grid. We have asked for a NIPA allocation. NIPA has a program for that. Western New York expansion and Recharge New York. We put apps in. We're following that program. What impacts will taking all the power from the system have on power supply and the rest of the landscape? Will there be any changes to the transmission system as a result of shutting down the power plant? I don't know why I asked that. I'm kind of this. Because we just answered that. The, the ISO will determine that. Okay. Do you plan on any site generation from the old power plant for internal use? If so, will the plant remain connected to the grid? So the answer to that is no. We, won't. we are going to attempt to use that interconnection for our load needs and for our solar needs. We're going to try to do both. Now, we're flipping the load model. Right? We're taking 300 megawatts away and we're adding, first time through, 50 megawatts up to 100. That's a delta. It's a pretty steep delta. We're not guessing on what that outcome is going to be. We're going to see what it's going to be. Am I correct in assuming that you will be replacing the current plant with a new building? Well, we didn't say that as we're presenting, but you kind of inferred it. Yes. These guys who do these data center projects want a building basically a, a, a Morton pole barn. Does everybody understand what I mean when I say that? It's just, it's just a pole barn. Now, there's been some questions around efficiency of this pole barn. What's the lighting? Um, so I, I can only kind of guess at the lighting, right? So maybe somebody's worried about kind of is it going to affect a view shed. There's not really a lot of outdoor lighting for this. It's pretty much enclosed. Um, it, it's their own incentive. They use a lot of energy. It's their own incentive to be as efficient as possible. And in fact, the NIPA allocations that you fill out ask you, are you going to be lead certified? So we're, we're trying to do everything we can to be as efficient as we possibly can with these buildings. So that means that the big smoke stack is going to come down? No. And I'm going to into that. But there are some questions in here on structure. You asked, so I'll answer that now. The current infrastructure, we want to keep. 
several reasons for that. Reason number one, we, there are opportunities when you bring a data center into this for larger growth. It attracts other business to be located near that data center. We'd like to use part of the current infrastructure, that office space, advertising in this space. We have talked about trying to use the plant as a training center. There's opportunities there. And back to the CP, CLCPA, CLCPA. There's, so that's the Community Leadership Client Protection Act. Climate Leadership and Community I keep saying the C's backwards. And I don't mean to be purposely making fun of that. It's a bit of a mouthful. It was two different bills that got hurt. Okay. So, it's my educated opinion that to meet the lofty goals on the generation side of that act, that technology hasn't been invented yet. And I'd like to put that technology on this site. I think it's a perfect place. So we want to stay open for business for other sources of projects, including it's a perfect place to put generation. That's what it's done for 70 years. So we're, we're going to maintain the structure. John put a slide up there. Pumps, fans, motors, we're draining oil, we're getting everything to be safe people-wise and safe environment-wise. Will you be using any part of the current power plant or its equipment for this project? So I sort of just answered that. It's a perfect segue. The property is in consolidated water district. Will the data center have a significantly different water district? I did that, yeah. I mean, it's anticipated that you know, we're, we can't quantify the water requirements right now, but we know it's going to be significantly reduced. You know, we don't know what the type, you know, potable or the lakes, lake water, you know, what the requirements are going to be and what type of water maybe they would require, even the specifics of the, of the data center as far as cooling is concerned. So that would be better quantified once we get into the, the detailed design of the data center itself. So. Terry, you didn't tell us why you were me. Um, if we could be polite and out, let them go through all the questions first, and then we'll systematically go through the questions that people are here. Like to stay organized and respectful, please. Okay? Thank you. And, and I'll, thank you, Ed. We're going to try to kind of work our way down. Who will own the server farm? How will you get internet service to the server farm? Are there opportunities for residents to benefit from running high speed internet? through Northern Lansing and be able to buy into the service. So I kind of grouped, that seemed like a nice group, so I grouped them together. So as we've talked about being able to take all this data, computing power, and get enough bandwidth to put it out, we've talked to a couple different service companies. And I'm not going to be good at this, but I'm going to just reiterate what I've read and what we've looked at. We have the ability to go to 5G. We think we have the ability to go to 10G. That's good. So the next thing I've asked about is, okay, we're in an area where there are residents who still do not. Is there anybody in here who doesn't have internet service at their house? The, the brains of the school doesn't have internet service at their house. So, we certainly want to, if there's a way to take advantage, broadening the use of broadband, excuse that term, we, we want to do it. I can't sit here and promise that now, but I know it's on your minds, it was a thought I had, because we struggled to actually get enough internet um, bandwidth at the plant. So yeah, we are going to be looking at that. Ed described that you're going to provide a battery backup to the grid at this location. <coughs> but I don't see that Jerry's information sheet. Could you give us more information? Okay, so I wanted to highlight this. I think I hit this already, but it's an important concept. So I have gotten in trouble by making this statement that I'm sometimes a little uh, tough to learn, so I'm going to say it again. Energy storage doesn't work. Now, I realize the technology works. I've been trying to do storage for three or four years. 
it, it's tough to make that work in today's market. It certainly works. We put storage in first in New York State under AES at the plant Binghamton at West Oak. Things <coughs> worked fantastic. And it was a different business. Okay, it was, uh, it was, uh, I mean, we, we did it as a gift. We didn't even cover the cost of the batteries. It's like a, uh, it was a philanthropic business. So I want to put storage in. I want to make it work. I, I understand the importance of that. Coupling it with solar, we could have a good debate about that because when solar is producing, you probably don't want to stuff it in your battery. You probably want to put it on the grid. So we got to figure out how to make that work too. So I, I was part of the battery storage meetings. I've been active in the ISO on this. The ISO is going to make changes to their regulatory framework. But storage is tough. We got room. I want to do it. I'm going back to the fact that this data center is a battery, sort of, and that it's going to do the same thing. In times of need, we're going to turn it off. That power is going to be available for other sources. So the people, am I hammered on that too much? Are you bored by that? Do people get that? I think it's important. The ISO, the ISO called it uh, demand side management on steroids when we talked to them. So I know they got it. Okay, what energy efficiency measures will the data center use? Lighting, what proportion of energy will be to go to running servers versus cooling the facility? Okay, I added this one because I don't know the answer to that second question. It's very good. I do not know cooling versus computer usage. It's, it's more on the computer usage. I don't know how much more. We're going to attempt to use like source sort of cooling um, a question that we've had is, okay, now you've been heating up the lake, now you're going to be heating up the lake again. This is very, very minimal compared to what we have been doing. I can't give you what that delta T is going to be, but it's going to be extremely minimal. Uh, we're going to look at that trade-off versus electricity for cooling. We'll certainly be looking at that right now with targeting the source. It's one of the reasons why I'm interested in getting the SUNY B, because this is what they're studying. Where on the property will the solar farm be located? Are you considering putting solar on top of the coal ash landfill? How many megawatt hours do they expect your solar or way to produce? Will the power from the solar farm be used on site or sold into the grid or both? If sold, will it be sold into the wholesale market? So I'll let you talk about where. We, we don't have a slide for it. Slide for it. So, <laughs> Ridge Road. Yeah, yeah, I'll back to you. Yeah, yeah, where Lake Ridge Road is, and are we familiar with Stark Road? We're actually put it on. It'll be on the northern side. There'll be uh, several panels on the northern side of Stark Road, right along North Ridge Road. Um, there'll also be um, several panels, uh, several areas, sites that we had. It used to be attributed uh, to as farmland. Uh, um, that's west of the actual of the landfill area. So there's actually three sites there that we're considering. Two are metals. One is uh, somewhat of a forested area. Uh, Jerry brought up the black walnut, so some of that uh, would, be, would be forested in, in that case to put that uh, the westernmost uh, solar array. And then we would place um, solar panels on the landfill. It'd be on the, the currently capped portion which is um, the eastern uh, section of the landfill and also the uh, north northwestern section of the landfill as well. So probably make up about close to 78 acres in columns. So, so, um, so megawatt hours. So what capacity factor, if people understand that term, right? How many hours of the day is your solar farm going to produce and how many megawatt hours you get on. So this number is improving. When I first looked at solar and I had no idea how solar worked. When I first looked at solar three years ago, New York State, that number was about 16%. So 16% times the installed megawatts is how many megawatt hours you get out of it. 
now that number is 18, 18 and a half percent. There are developers out there that are saying they think they can get 20. So 20 is a pretty, pretty high bar for New York State. New York State, we, I still don't, maybe you have seen Irene, but I still don't find anybody that can tilt them to follow the sun. You can, okay? But what happens up here is they have a hard time surviving winter and then I can, the, the amount of dollars that you have to put in to maintain that tilting function versus the extra megawatt hours you get out, the developers I'm talking to, that it's not worth it to me. So we're looking at, are you agreeing with me? That's twice to me. Dan, you better put that in your um, So, you know, we're, it, it, these aren't necessarily the producers that you see in, in, you know, in Nevada and so forth, but you know, we're, we're going to try to do what we can with these. Uh, the energy. So I've already stated that we're approaching this as two separate projects. If we get both done, we'd love to have our data center tenants be our solar energy users. If they aren't using it all or they do turn off, we will also be, have the ability to put this on our more solar, of course, I've already mentioned it. Are there plans for expanding the data center in the future? Where will the power come from this expansion? So, uh, we've stated this already, we're initially looking at a 50 megawatt interconnection that goes through, we make it work, we're gonna file to go to another 50. We think 100 probably taps us out, but I can't stand here now and talk about it. Where will that come? We're, we're going to always be looking to take this off from the street. That's our source of power for this. Solar on site. Maybe this next sec now, maybe we'll put a nuclear in there. We <laughs> 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 just lost everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that's our plans. Expansion and continue to look at the next technology source. Are you going to continue to use the, oh, this is, this came up a lot, rail. So what are we going to do with rail? So, we don't own a lot of the rail, so I can't answer that question. Okay, we own, what's, where do we own, what's the name of that road? The Old Millicus Road. Old Millicus Road. We own, yeah. From there on, Center line of that road. we own. Center line. Center line. Center line. To the north. To the north. Yep, center line to the north. And so we're going to maintain our tracks. Why? It's easy to do, and you never know. Now that's not because we're looking to bring coal in, or we're looking to bring rail CNG. It's just easy to do. We're going to try to keep our options open for anything on this site. What NS does, I can't answer. I have received many emails. What's Cargill going to do? What's going on? You know, I, 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 I'm not here to answer. The answer to that is we're maintaining ours. I don't know about the rest of those. So. Another question that comes up a lot. Are you going to apply for a tax abatement? I, I do not want to. This is not my decision. It's our owners. They tend to listen to what I want to do on local issues like this. I don't think there's a need to for this. So I, I, what, I, I know it sounds like I'm hedging, OK? I, it's not my intent. I do not want to. I don't think it's necessary for this project. We're looking to get a NYSERDA allocation, some Empire State Development funding to get this kicked off. Taxes. So I have talked to the county assessor, and we're both trying to figure out how you tax the data. It's unique, but one thing I've learned with this county, and, and I'll make a little plug here, I'm going off script. Having an assessing department done by the county is, is, is really good. There's only two counties in the state that do that. And that's what they do for a living, they're very good at this, and um, so I, you know, we'll come up with something. It's going to be a decent, significant. I don't know if it's going to be in the 
the old days said, or what, what's what is it? You know the numbers right now. Uh, 20 years ago, it was 233 million. I don't uh, think we're going to get assessed on that. 20 million to now it's versus 160 million now it's 20. It, you know, we're working. We're working together. We want to get the number right. There's no sense getting this thing done and then starting to fight. So that's what I'm putting out there. Okay, current operations. So uh, we touched on this once before, but there was a lot of folks to talk about this. So I'm going to sort of dip my toe in here again. How many jobs will decommissioning create? Are you going to hire local labor for the construction phase? How many workers from the current operation will be eligible for positions in the proposed data center? I lumped all those in with the questions I got and I kind of theme that. So again, I want to make sure everybody understands we're talking about people who have worked at this site, who put their kids through school. There is at least one set of three generation employees who worked at this site. Okay? This has been a good living for a lot of people. These guys have worked hard. Decommissioning. John's talked about it. We have an obligation to run our water treatment system, to monitor, to, to continue to test for a long time. Now, it's not going to take a lot of people, but it's going to take some. We believe our guys will be the best to do that. Certainly not going to be the jobs that are there. But that's what we're looking to do. Construction, are you going to do local labor? Well, of course we are. And again, ESD and NIPA both have a section of local labor. What's, what's the verbiage for the fair wage? Prevailing wage. Yeah, thank you, you said that. Prevailing wage, prevailing wage, almost all the uni jobs are higher than prevailing wage. I'm not sure I know how to define that, but we are going to do local we talked to the local shops. They're excited about this. Um, so, you know, that's what we're going to do. New jobs at the data center. Uh, it, it's really a completely different skill set. So we're going to do what we can to try to figure out how to turn a guy who's welded all his life into a guy who's now going to be doing keyboard work. Uh, honestly, I'm not sure our guys desire those. Jobs, but we're going to try. It's, it's a tough, tough mm -hmm. fit there. Um, we have worked with the local labor groups in the past, Tompkins County Workforce, and we're going to get them involved. We're going to try to figure this out so everybody has a self lead. I think there will be a few people that just simply say, I, I'm good, I've had it, and kind of retire. That's going to be a personal decision for every one of these employees. So I appreciate the support. There was a ton of questions around the employees. We're going to try to do what we can. That's three. <laughs> OK, site cleanup. So, and I'll work the stack question into this, OK? Um, we have an obligation continue to monitor. There is no contamination on the site. We want to keep it that way. We're going to continue to follow all our permits. We do daily inspections. We do monthly inspections. The DC is out annually. They review all our reports. We're going to continue to honor all of that. That's what we plan on doing. So we'll continue to do our closure, ta closure tasks to make sure that there is no adverse impacts then to air to surface water and to groundwater at the, at the site. Um, somebody asked about PCVs. There's, there's no PCV contamination on the that site. Is the and the stack. So we have an obligation to cap the stack. That's important. Um, you don't want rainwater just coming in there and then the city to build it up. We do not plan on doing any uh, demolition of the stacks. Solar on the landfill. We're going to talk about this one more time. We're going to put solar on the landfill. We're going to try to qualify for a second NYSERDA grant that looks to try to help companies put solar on landfill. 
We talked to the DEC. They have a procedure. They would like to see us go so hard by our yes, very So we're, we're, we're targeting that. When we close, we have an obligation to close that landfill. Part of it's closed now, part of it is open and being used, and then there's a third part that's ready to be used, but it's not closed. Mm -hmm. The part that we're actively using will stay open long enough while we treat water, because when we treat water, we have a sludge process. We're allowed to put sludge on that site. It's, it's permitted for that. But that active piece will start to close. Eventually, the entire site will be closed. Closed means capped. Um, it will be capped with an 18-inch uh, non-permeable clay soil. And over top, there will be a polyethylene liner over top. And then there will be a protective uh, uh, soil cover on top and then a uh, six-inch top soil and then vegetative growth over the top. So the landfill will be completely encapsulated both on the top and the bottom, bottom through groundwater suppression, which keeps you know, the integrity of the, the landfill such that groundwater that won't impede the, the landfill. So it's hydraulically isolated. It will be hydraulically isolated and separated from the landfill, the groundwater. So the groundwater will be, the suppression system will divert the water away from the landfill to make to sure that the integrity of the landfill stays stays uh, well. Um, it'll be uh, this all this cap now will completely eliminate any contact storm water with uh, coal combustion products. Um, I mentioned about the groundwater suppression system. That will continue to be monitored as, as well throughout the, this 30 year of monitoring. That will be monitored as well. Um, We'll continue, there will continue to be uh, inspections. We have on-site monthly inspections. We also have a third-party annual inspection done by a professional engineer that's done every year, which generates a report. We'll continue to you know, be regulated under Part 360 as well as the new uh, our coal combustion rule, the federal rule, that we're uh, regulated under as well. We'll continue to be regulated under that. We'll continue to be regulated under the, the DC. Uh, they've been very proactive in oversight and looking at our annual groundwater monitoring reports all and all, going through all our inspections. We also send them an annual uh, Part 360 report that, that gets into detail on all the inspections. Uh, the financial assurance, they approve all the financial assurance changes, any changes, any modifications to the landfill has to go through the DEC. That is all going to continue beyond the closure of the facility. And there is a site that you talked about that will show the DEC sonic animation. What's that? That website? Oh, yes. We have, we have a, as part of the CCR rule, we do have a public website. It's a scoc1.weebly.com, which actually has, it goes through, uh, we have dust control, annual dust control reports, our annual inspection reports are, are included in there. Groundwater reports are uh, in there. It's all public, publicly accessible website. We're good. Okay. So, as I mentioned earlier today, uh, we have these sheets that you have know, signed up. Um, I'm starting with number 14. I'm gonna first of all, I'm gonna talk, say a disclaimer that any mispronunciation of names is no sign of disrespect <laughs> because that'll happen. Um, the first one I have is Mr. Riger, is it? Are you Robert? Oh, yeah. Rieger? Okay. Second one is Randy Smith. And the other thing I'd like to say, please keep your questions concise. Um, I know we're all passionate about this, but please no editorials, no lectures, no arguing, no disrespect, because this is just the start of a continuing process of information going forward. So, on that note, then, I have Randy Smith. On that note, I'm good. <laughs> oh, my right. The next one is, is it Rob Jetty? Good. Okay. The next one is Lori and Jeff Moscow. I do have a question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to know what the time frame is. Do you have any idea of when it's going to start, when it's going to end? 
I mean, okay. if, the, if the New York Power Authority grants the power. Right. Okay, this is all hypothetical. Yeah, it's the whole, like, even if it's all hypotheticals, yeah, so let's, let's do the schedule like I set it up, right? So the line in the sand, let's pick a date. July 1st, we get a phone call that says you're awarded. The, 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 the piece of the scope that we're going to chase from there is the interconnect. That's going to take the longest amount of time. Okay. We think we can get through the interconnect process in 18 to 20 months. We can have the data center up and running quicker than that. Okay. The solar, the data center permitting, we believe is easier to permit. It's a more important part. The, the solar is a bit more of a permitting process. We think if we got July 1st that we could be producing energy from our solar field early 21. We shoot for 20, but we think early 20. That's going to take an interconnect process too. The ISO is getting overrun. The New York Independent System Operator that governs the interconnection process is getting overrun with as mostly downstate, but as projects are coming on, you got to evaluate all of this. So my answer is 18 months to 20 months for an interconnect. The, the data center can be built quicker. The solar is about in that time frame. Okay, so these are all going to have to be currently or consecutive. Yes. <laughs> okay. I'd like to have them happen concurrent. We can do that. We can do that if all the permits fall. Yeah. Yeah. It's different <coughs> pieces of land that we're looking to to build this. Um, a data center. And I don't think I covered this either. A data center is like let's say 40 feet by 700 feet. So it's kind of this oblong building. And we think 50 megawatts is probably one and a half to two of those. And so we'd be looking to put that on site and then the solar over. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. And Ann Rose has a question about jobs. I appreciate that you expressed concern for your current workers, maybe 28 or 30 of them. Um, and that you would seek to use as many as possible in the remediation and that you would seek state assistance for retraining. My question is, would you consider for those who can't take advantage of those things that you're offering, would you consider severance pay or a contribution to retirement for the, the ones who are not able to take advantage? Yeah, so my answer there is we, we have a current factor conditions are coming up. Would you consider going beyond your current contract? I, I, I'm not the person who will be doing that. I, I'm encouraging you to consider going beyond your current okay. I'll take the feedback. Thank you. Is the contract public information? Next one is John Dennis. Yes, hi. Thanks for the uh, very informative presentation. Uh, You're welcome. It, and it's an exciting project. I am concerned about uh, uh, legacy contamination at the site. So uh, roughly 2 million tons of coal ash are thought to be contacting groundwater. The, the, the groundwater suppression system was designed and built in 1977. Uh, one person has suggested that the spacing is not adequate. Is it still running at 100% efficiency as to what it was put in? And if not, is there a possibility of, of actually digging up some of the stuff that is touching the groundwater, if that's found to be the case? What happens there is kind of the groundwater suppression, and actually we, do, we go through and we visually check groundwater suppression, uh, all the piping, and we actually do a, a flush on an annual, minimal annual basis to ensure that there is the groundwater suppression system is fully functional. So it is operating at 100% capacity because we do, said we are proactive in ensuring that the groundwater suppression system is operating properly. For the reason that the DC suggested that the, the, the cap is working, less water is getting in, yes, exactly. and it's drying out, are you seeing a reduction in 
the actual amount of leachates that's coming into the sediment pond annually, because I, I believe you're releasing the lake between 20 and 30 million gallons uh, per year. Because, well, because we have now a much smaller footprint um, of, you know, of an active site, that's, yeah, I guess, statement is true that it's, it's less, obviously less stormwater coming in contact with the cold combustion products, uh, combustion byproducts. And once this, the, the site is closed, that active site will be capped with the clay, you know, the polyethylene liner, so that no uh, storm will come in contact with any you know, cold there, there, there's, there's, there's no release of leachate to the cold gas. No release of leachate. is tested. And during, before, during, and after. And we wouldn't release anything into the it. So you're saying the, the fluid, because your stormwater is also going into that sediment. You're saying it because you're mixing stormwater with it, it's no longer called leachate? It's, you can call it leachate, but the stormwater comes around the system mm -hmm. and into the pond. That's what it was designed for, but it's stormwater. Okay, it's, it's when we test it, it's stormwater. And that's what's released to the lake. Yeah, we'll have to sit down and discuss this in detail because, I mean, the, there is a flow from underneath the landfill it's in contravention of DEC's principles to be mixing stormwater into that pond. That pond should be dedicated for DJ. And I realize you run it through a sand filter, but the sand yes. filter is, you know, very valuable technology. It makes it less turbid, but it's not removing heavy metals. So we're concerned about bioaccumulation in aquatic biota uh, up to the trophic levels for its fish, and it's the drinking water supply of 50,000 people, roughly. So, you know, these are long-term issues that uh, you know, probably be there 1,500, 200 years from now. It's a long-term issue. We hope that uh, financial assurance is what, 10 million, 6 million? What is it right now? It's enough to cover 30 years. Yeah, but when we read through the details, it's enough to cover for 30 years of sampling and analysis of the water samples. As I, the last time I looked at, at it, there was no money for uh, repairs of tears and liners. You know, even general sort of types of maintenance. So anyway, that's, that's there's a very important step for maintaining you know, the, the site as well. Well, I mean, let's sit down and talk about it a bit yes. more. I suspect maybe it's you know a bit. Thanks very much. Thank you. Next one, Sue Roth. Yes. Hi. Uh, I wonder if you are open to having the town form a task force made up of community members and experts to help. Us the transition to a data center? Yes. Repeat the question. So she's asking, I'll repeat it to make sure I got it. Does that okay. work? She's asking if we would form a task force to help with the transition. Of the town. Of the town and it's, it's done in involves. Other, it's been done in other places yep. where you form a task force with people to just make sure we do the village yep. as it's so I'm not the decision maker on that either, but I'll take back the feedback. Um, I have gotten emails asking for that. Is it Holyoke? Am I saying yes. that right? Yes. Um, so I'll, I'll take that back. We're certainly willing, we've come here tonight, we're certainly willing to sit down and talk about this as, as we move forward. Thank you. So Sue makes a good point about the task force, how we capture that energy that people want to make this a successful project. And one of the things is that, I guess, personally, to, to ask for your guidance, what's the first thing that we can do as a community? Is it something we can do to write letters? Is there okay. anything we can do here that what is the first homework assignment we can do before we move, we move forward? Because if the New York, if the New York Park Authority does not grant this, this ends before we go to step three, four, five, and 12, whatever. So if you could send me some guidelines, I'll be happy to share. The other thing I would ask Sue, in all fairness, and we've done this to other groups, is to have somebody be the point person of your group, and we can do the email through that point person or persons, so that we can uh, talk back and forth, whether it be Jerry to myself or Jerry to you directly at CC, the, the town board. That is a good start to all this moving forward. 
Next one is Fred and Shirley Stone. At this point, we're satisfied. Okay. Um, which brings up a point that if questions come up in the future, feel free to share them to the to either the supervisor or the town board members, because I'm optimistic we'll be having lots of conversations in the near future. Uh, Dave Wolf. Dave Wolf here. He had the lead. Okay. Next one is Margaret McCaslin. Yes. Um, my question is similar to John Dennis's, um, and I, I lived in the area a long time ago when there, before the large landfill that you have now, and so I'm wondering what kind of monitoring and remediation is going to be done around the older cash dump, uh, ash dumps, and also I'm. Um, but the 30 year, <laughs> none of this stuff's going to evaporate in 30 years. So I'm just wondering, are there any options for ongoing monitoring and remediation after 30 years? So I'll take the first one. We're responsible for the landfill. So I'm not even sure. I'm you speak up? We're responsible for the landfill on our site. I, I don't. I'm not even sure if I know where there's other. Are you referring to the, the landfills on, on Davis Road? And those are owned by NYSIG, so when, so I don't know, NYSIG continues to monitor and maintain those that sites. That was part of the acquisition when the plant was sold in 99. Um, so I get the point on 30 years. Um, I, we've looked at the engineering of this. We're pretty confident that this remains intact as it is now. I, I can't answer your question governed by the DEC, the DEC holds us to 30 years. Okay. Paul Sutter? Oh, I'm fine. That's the big one. Ruth, yeah. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Ruth <laughs> <laughs> and Roger Hopkins? Uh, thank you. Three quick questions. Uh, is there any difference between a data hub and a power plant regarding security and fire protection? That's a great question. So, security I think we would probably maintain the security we have now. So the place is entirely fenced in. There's only one way in through the gate. Right now that gate is unmanned. If you need a, a fob to get in and out, I think we'd maintain that same security. Okay. These guys, I mean, a data breach is a big deal, right? So these guys are going to want to make sure that the data is secure. I forgot the second part of the question. Uh, fire protection. Fire protection. They have... This is a big deal, right? It's computers, so yeah, they have their own fire protection system. So uh, we haven't engineered that. I probably won't engineer that. That'll probably be something they tell us that they want, but they do have fire protection systems. Do you have any, uh, your eyes on the uh, station property in the store? Do you support uh, converting that to state force? Or would you oppose that? Or agree not to oppose it? <laughs> okay, so. The question is the bell station next door. So let's define the framework of the question. I wasn't necessarily around when that was built, but I'm kind of told that the foundation is still it's on the property. Yes. 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 The off the record, if I was Lord, what would I do? I'd certainly swap their really nice solar places. It probably isn't where we'd be looking to do a park anyways. And say, hey, if you give me that for solar, I'll give you this for a nice park. I am not the decision maker. Don't take that back to my boss. <laughs> but it, that kind of makes sense to me to do something. I mean, I don't want to put trees down, put solar up. They got some nice looking solar place there. That's, that's nice. And just to find a quick one, would you consider having some kind of uh, public access to the lake? Yeah, okay. So we had that question. Okay. Um, so I have to hedge all of these that I am not the decision. Just okay. But I, I, 
We sort of do now because we have the fishermen's Fishers access. Um, but to answer your first question, we probably keep the data center fenced in. So if we can figure out to accommodate both of those, of course we take a look at it. Thank you. Sounds like a win win if we can do something with Bell Station. I find it ironic that Bell Station was going to be a nuclear power plant there. Now, now we seem to come full circle talking about nuclear. It's um, but for somebody to go through where you could use that for your solar, let's say hypothetically it goes into your next phase and leave the rest, not as a state forest, we have to go through all this 480 acres, we get there at 20, we have the, all these other red tape. It would be nice if we had, so here's the property, this is what we want, you can have the woods and the shoreline, have that. Um, Dean Shea. Uh, so a lot of my questions were answered, but I do have one regarding the fly ash. There's various building products made out of fly ash. I use oral, true, exterior trim, siding products, for instance. Is there, have you found any market or have you tested those markets? You probably have. I'll, because John's going to want to jump in here. He's probably already dancing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have bought beneficial use determinations to sell fly ash. We continue to sell fly ash in the state. Yeah, we sell DOT, spec ash, concrete ash. So how would that um, affect tapping off the land to be able to access that? Well, we sell it as we produce it, yeah. or we might. We have been approached at mining the current site. We haven't really come to a conclusion yet, and that's really the right thing to do on that property. What do you mean by mining? Reopening the site. <coughs> So the other piece of this is, 
if there is new gas generation, that's like an if with a great big capital, okay? It's going to be generators that will support intermittent energy. Unfortunately, our set wasn't designed for that. It takes us 12 hours to start the unit. The market wants units to start up in 10 minutes. And so, you know, that's just where we're at. So there, there's, there's a whole lot of reasons why it's going to be very difficult to ever see us repurpose this site as generation. I'm not saying no. I'm not trying to be clever. I'm just simply saying we're looking to flip this to be a low. Uh, Charles Reed? I'm good. Joe Wilson? Oh, more questions. Okay. Uh, sound like more questions. Okay, thank you. Joe Wilson? Yeah, I've, you may have covered this. My note taking is not the best. Um, but over the period of time, over what period of time do you expect to do your cleaning up that you feel you're required to do? So, because it sounded like you're a little soft-spoken like myself. His question was, over what period of time is it going to take for us to do our cleanup, our decommissioning? At least two years. Now, it's going to take, for instance, on a coal pile, all of that water is captured into a vessel and we treat it. The plan would be, the water that's captured in that vessel after the coal is gone and we put soil and grass on here and it's just raining on soil and grass but we're still capturing it our permit says we got to treat it well we're going to go to the DEC and say look <coughs> it's just rainwater we're just treating normal rainwater and then we'll have to probably can do that consecutively for some time and then they will say okay you can stop treating so I can't answer how long you understand why yes okay are there other phases beyond what you just described? That's probably the longest. Probably. The longest. That's why I went to that one. Okay, thank you. Susan Hedlinger. Jonathan Comstock. Yeah, um, I'm, just, I'm actually just puzzled about the uh, ability to turn the data center off. I don't know very much about this. But, yeah, the little the, the articles I've read in the past talked about one of the things that was really important was their consistency, their stability. Yep. If if Cornell's in the middle of some massive calculation using your system and you turn it off, what, so how how does that limit your ability? To it's a good question. So let's first just talk about that versus let's say New Core Steel, who really can't do this, right? It's a process. If they're in the middle of their process and they lose energy, everything they got they have to start from scratch. Okay, so what these data centers can do is this data center can be formed in this calculation, this data center over here in Montana can be mimicking it. So they'll set up for if this goes down, this just picks right up seamless. Now how that actually works in real life, you've hit my intelligence at this point. But that's what they, they talk about mirroring and backing up. Okay, and that's why they can offer this. Now, they, demand side management means you can't say no occasionally, but you can't say no every time. Right? You're still going to have to meet a minimum requirement of hours that you said you could do this. But, but that's, that's the best I can answer that question. Okay. Judy Pierpong? You say these data centers. Um, I'm suddenly hearing a lot about like, you know, Montana, California, there's one starting up in um, Georgia, two here. Are there, how much is needed and are there more, are there plans for more of them? You know, can we expect to see them coming along all over the place? They take an incredible amount of energy. You know, is there any kind of planning on how much is actually needed? Uh all pretty darn good questions. <coughs> Very unanswerable. <amazing. laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm starting to learn these two, and we're trying to gather intelligence. It seems to be a little bit more prevalent abroad than here. They 
certainly chase climate because they obviously want to take advantage of a colder climate so they can do less eating. They're located more north. Um, I, I don't think they're going away. Okay, I think the need, the computing power need is going to be continued. There are lots of them I can't. They're good questions. I just, I'm not. <coughs> Sean Black. She lived. Tom Butler. Would you like to uh, go out on a limb and, and guess whether this energy allocation is going to happen? No. <laughs> <laughs>
You haven't answered the question yet. Have you? So um, I hate to hit on this again, but I'm probably one of the youngest people in the room. So this 30-year uh, sort of limitation is concerning to me um, for many reasons. But I'm wondering, it seems like you're shying away from an exact number telling us how, how much you have as far as you're in your ARO that you're required to carry um, for like a bond or something for remediation over the long term. Um, and I guess my other part of that question is what if you get to the end of 30 years and still seeing like there's contamination from the, the coal ash landfill, what is going to happen then? Um, yeah. Okay, so not necessarily shying away, that number floats a little bit. Yeah, the DC will continue to monitor that site. I meant, I meant the, the dollar value of the bond. Yes, we just close part of the site. Yes, because we're coming close part of the site, the financial insurance changes. It's, it's you want, I have a number, yeah, it's $7.9 million. So $8 million, 7.9. And is that adequate to cover if there is contamination or, or within the, you know, rip tear of the line or something? It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's to cover the, the closure and then to monitor and maintain the site. So. And in our monitoring right now, we will continue to monitor. Our monitoring right now shows no contamination. Okay, so we're not afraid that something's going to happen later on. As far as the 30-year part, it's it's what the DEC has told us to do. So, I mean, I guess if you have some concerns with that, you need to register that. Does anybody else have not asked a question yet? Yes. So, um, about the encapsulation of the landfill, do you know, and if so, how do you know that that encapsulation can withstand like a really major weather event, like a hurricane that causes massive flooding and down trees and down power lines? I'm going to try to take this. <laughs> so, down trees and power lines aren't an issue because we have a permit to keep all that away from vegetation. Okay? Massive flooding. Um, I don't know what massive means. Well, say so like the whole it, site is really completely empty. Yeah. So if that were to happen on this site, and so I'm being very, very hypothetical here. I really don't. If that, if we had enough water to start to move that site, we're in trouble. Not because that site's moving, okay? <laughs> because of all the other flooding that's going to occur because of that much water. That site is, is um, it's engineered to take that out. But there, there are power lines in the area. Like it, it's something fell on that material. And there's no power lines. Really there's no power lines near that site. There's nothing. Those power lines are far enough away. Yeah, we talk yeah. about the transmission lines. Yeah. yeah. They, 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 they fall, they will not come. Yeah. Okay. okay. Someone else wants to ask a question. Joe? Yeah, um, I'm still trying to understand why you're not following a generation system that you have no plan to start up again. Why would why? Mothballing the generation system that you're not planning on using again. Why not scrap the ER, uh, sell it off, or move it out of there and utilize that fish or something else? That may happen. I want to see what happens as an outcome of the, the lack of generation that's going to be on supporting the grid. I still think there's a technology out there. going to be controversial, what I said, okay? And I do not believe we can power New York State with solar. I don't understand how that can happen. I realize others do, I just don't. So something's going to be built to help power New York State. Maybe transmission gets built so that we can finally do something in the western part of the state and feed that. It, uh, our turbines require a certain amount of startup time. I don't see them being used again, but we certainly can use parts of that facility. Bus work, dump work, the electrical components. So I don't think it's worth scrapping at this point. So your question is, rather than scrapping this level, do something, why are you keeping that building up there? I'm gonna to refer to our planner, CJ, and she's taught me a lot about existing buildings and the greenness they have. Keep telling me this this quote, which is which is the greenest building is the one that's already built. <laughs> because otherwise you got to find a home for it. It goes away. Where does it go away? It goes in a hole, and then you 
bury the hole. Where did the sack of Wegmans grocery store go? Away. It's into some hole. Not throwing any stones at Wegmans, because we're saying there's a lot of stuff there. Or the old library. Where'd that go? It went away. In some hole. So it's best to keep the building there. Any other questions? I am going to get to you, I promise, right now. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm just as a point of information. I am a chair of a county committee that oversees the closed landfill. And uh, we've been closed for 25 years. We actually had a meeting last night. We installed a new bedrock a well there last month. So there's no plans to stop monitoring at 30 years. Anyway, even though that's the regulations, the county hasn't, has said that they continue to have an interest in monitoring it. The, the question I wanted to say is that the environmental management system on this site was designed in 1977. There are issues with that. You could not build that landfill today. It, you know, there were very few solid waste regulations in 1977. And so there are issues and we need to resolve them. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you weren't managing the site well, given the uh, nature of the management system, but there are certain improvements that can be made, and I'd love to talk to you about this. Good. Anyone else have any questions before we have to run next door? Um, yes? Just, the coal comes in by rail. Is that going to go out by rail? Can you remove the coal from the facility? Oh, yeah, uh,